Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to uh, you know, thank Pat for the introduction and also thank the IFF for their commitment to excellence. Um, as Pat mentioned, I've worked across the world in the fitness industry for about 20 years now. And I can say with 100% certainty that the vision that the IFF has for the wellness and fitness of their members parallels any organization across the world. And so I, I really think that they deserve a big round of applause for the efforts that they're making towards the, the wellness and fitness of, of the members. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I also want to say that every time I have an opportunity to, to work with the IFF and speak to firefighters, I'm both humbled and inspired by the work that you guys do every day. And so I want to thank you guys for what you do. Uh, and it is because of what you do that I do the work that I do. And so I'm committed to trying, help, or trying to help firefighters live better lives. And so what I would like to do today is share some of the insights that I've learned over the past number of years, working with a variety of populations, and particularly firefighters, to help you guys live better lives every single day. And I'd like to start off with a story. So about six years ago, I had an opportunity to give uh, a wellness and fitness workshop to a, a fire department in Canada. And it was about a 45 minute workshop, very, very simple. The idea was to review a few of the strategies that we've been investigating to help firefighters be more effective, safer, on the fire ground and in the gym. And it was just a preliminary thing, wasn't meant to be uh, big or anything. So after the workshop, I had a 20 year captain come up to me and he said, I just have to say thank you. I've had pain in my right knee for 20 years. Every single time I walk up the stairs, every single time I get in and out of the truck. It's like after going through this 45 minute workshop today, I had no pain. First time in 20 years. I was like, wow, I didn't expect any of that. Guy came up to me two months later and said, honestly, you've changed my life. I haven't had pain since that day. Absolutely unbelievable. I learned two things from that workshop and the experience with that firefighter. One, small things can make a massive difference in the quality of our lives. Second one is the impact that our peer fitness trainers can have, that exercise professionals can have, extends far beyond the gym environment. This is quality of life. I think we have to think bigger picture and demand more when we're considering wellness and fitness. It isn't just exercise. It's so much bigger than that. It's quality of life. And this firefighter, paying for 20 years, he proves that. A lot of the things that we talk about from a fitness standpoint are critical to quality of life, safety on the fire ground. And so what I'd like to do for you guys over the next 60 minutes or so is really share some of these insights, some of the things that, that we shared with these firefighters. So you guys can walk out of here today with some small things to make your life different tomorrow. And that you can share those same things with your peers back at the station, with your family members and your friends at home. I want to give you guys a few very simple practical strategies that you can walk out of here with. I also want you guys to be a little selfish for a second. You know, teamwork is incredibly important to the fire service. But for the next 60 minutes, I want you guys to be a little selfish. I want you to think about what does wellness and fitness or health and safety mean to me? Get greedy about that for a sec. What does it mean to you when you hear health and wellness or health and fitness? And why might it be important to you? Really think about that for a sec. As a fitness professional or an exercise professional, I don't want to get up here and tell you guys what's important. I want you guys to tell me what's important to you. And so I really want you to reflect on what are those things that are important to you. So the whole time that I'm speaking up here, really hold those close. Really think about what's important. And think, how does what I'm speaking to impact me? Be selfish with it. Maybe it's going to be about the job. Maybe when you hear health and wellness, health and safety, this is what comes to mind. 
I want to be safe on the fire ground to protect my brothers, my sisters, the community men members that we're trying to protect. When I'm at the scene of an emergency, this is what I'm thinking about. I got to be uh, healthy, safe there, be really, really effective. Maybe it's got nothing to do with the job. Maybe when you think health and wellness, it's about being inspired by competition, trying to chase things that you never thought were possible. Maybe you're inspired like firefighters like Matt Long from the New York Fire Department who overcame adversity, terrible accident, willed himself to come back and still run, still compete in Ironman. Maybe it's got nothing to do with either of those two things. Maybe when we talk about health and wellness, maybe this is what it's about. Maybe the first thing that popped into your head is, I want to go home at the end of the day. I want to spend time with my kids. I want to be there for my grandkids when I retire. Maybe this is the stuff that's really important. This is what I want you guys to hold close. Like I said, I don't want to tell you what's important. I want you to tell me what's important. Whether it's the job, whether it's competition and all the recreational activities you do, or it's the life that you have at home. I really want you to reflect on what wellness and fitness means to you. So that as we're speaking to this, as we're moving forwards with the peer fitness training program and the initiatives that the IFF has in place, this is what we're catering to. It's no longer just exercise. This is quality of life. We're improving the lives of the members. Regardless of what that means for you, we're going to try and cater to all of these things. Exercise is a great tool to achieve that. So whether your, your focus is health and safety on the job, whether it is to run the first marathon, whether it is to play with your kids when you go home at the end of the day, exercise is a fantastic tool. It helps with rehab, it helps with management, it helps with prevention. Maybe you're an elite athlete on the side, helps with performance. Exercise can do a lot of really, really good things. But there's a caveat. A lot of people don't like to exercise. A lot of people hate the idea of exercise. A lot of people get bored. A lot of people feel like they're maybe a hamster on a wheel. That's the reality. And so we have to listen to what people want. Again, I can't tell you what's important. If this is the reality, if people don't like exercise, okay, what do we do? It's not those people's problem that they don't like exercise. That's my problem and how I'm delivering the message. The other thing, a lot of people are getting hurt while they exercise, particularly in the fire service. There's some data that's been coming out over the past few years that said upwards of a third of the injuries that are being sustained by firefighters are happening while exercise and, uh, exercising and training. And you can imagine that you know, when certain people hear these type of statistics, get their hands up a little bit. And it's like, well, exercise is supposed to be this thing that's helping us out, that's making us better prepared, that's improving the quality of our life. But it's also hurting us. So maybe we should just do away with the exercise thing. Maybe it's causing more problems than, it, than it's helping. And, you know, I can stand up here 100% sure and say, well, that's not what we should be doing. We shouldn't be dismissing the value of exercise and regular physical activity because there's obvious benefits. But maybe we need to rethink how we're viewing exercise and how we're using it. The other thing to consider, the most fit people. Anybody a football fan here? RG3? Redskins? RG3 is a phenomenal athlete, one of the fittest people in the world. 40 inch vertical jump, 4 5 40. The guy's phenomenal. But he's always hurt. Right? So if RG3 is one of the most phenomenal athletes in the world, like some of our firefighters, but he's always hurt, is he really physically prepared to do what he's supposed to do on a daily basis? 
Same thing with our members. We could have the most fit firefighters that are always hurt. Are they really the most physically prepared to perform the job? Are they the safest, the most effective? Are they leading the best lives when they go home? Is their quality of life better than everybody else? Maybe not. Again, maybe we need to rethink this whole exercise piece, this whole health and wellness piece. We need to look at it through a bit of a different lens. We need to redefine what wellness and what fitness really means to us. Because again, I go back to the things that are important to you guys. I go back to health and safety on the job. I go back to wanting to play with your kids. That's the stuff that's really, really important. And so if that's the stuff that's really important, we should be making sure that any type of effort that we're making from a fitness standpoint, from a wellness standpoint, is geared towards those things. If it's not, we're very misdirected. And that could be one of the reasons why people don't like to exercise. Maybe they're not seeing the benefit. I don't care about making firefighters better in the gym. I don't. You know, I could give you a bigger bench press and a bigger squat. It doesn't matter to me because most firefighters don't care. Most firefighters go back to those three things I talked about. It's the job, it's my life at home, and it's any recreational stuff I want to do. Let's make sure we're making a difference there. We have to redefine what fitness really is, and we have to re redefine how we're viewing fitness. So I, look, I, I ask you guys to look at the picture here on the slide. Look at the guys on the right and how they're running up the, the hill. Then look at the guys on the left. You see any differences? I don't know if anybody in here has ever run up a sand dune. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I'd probably look like those guys on the left. But the guys on the left are getting a very, very different response than the guys on the right who aren't burying their hands in the sand. How we exercise on a daily basis matters. How we exercise in the gym, on a sand dune, really, really matters. Because the adaptations that we get from exposing ourselves to this type of demands will dictate how much transfer we get to those things that are really, really important. How much does this stay on the sand dune versus how much does this carry over to the fire ground? How much does this carry over to me enjoying a life in retirement playing with my grandkids? That's what we have to focus on. We have to really think about how does this transfer to the things that are really, really important. And so that's what we're trying to do with the peer fitness training program. We're really putting an emphasis on the transfer piece, on the quality of life piece, on making sure exercise matters for our firefighters. Let's really get them thinking about what's important in their life and make sure that all the effort that we're making from a wellness and a fitness standpoint, that that's uh, aligned directly with what most matters to them. That's what we're trying to do. So I'm just going to show you guys a video here. This is a, an individual trying to get strong. You know, so he's becoming more fit by lifting heavy things in a gym environment. But I still cringe every time I see that. Would you guys consider that a desirable way to get strong? Probably not. Okay, there's a lot of things going on here. One, maybe how he's doing it. You guys probably see, you know, he's rounding his back quite a bit. You've probably been told before that that's not good. And in combination with the load he's lifting, that could be a recipe for disaster. But on the positive side, he's probably getting strong, right? Maybe not. Again, we have to think about what are we doing this for in the first place? What are the adaptations that we're looking for? What are we trying to make better in our lives outside of the gym? How is this helping me out there? If we're going to talk about injuries a little bit, I want to give you guys a very basic injury definition. And this is any and true of any injury. So if you look at the slide here, we have a nice big blue line at the top. That's the strength of your tissues. And when I say tissues, I mean bones, I mean ligaments, I mean discs, I mean muscles, all that stuff. The black line on the bottom 
is the load being applied to those tissues. So if I walk too far and I fall down the stairs and I bump my head on the ground, the ground's going to apply a load to my head. If that load exceeds the strength of my head, my head's going to break. If a firefighter falls through a floor, hits the ground, if the ground exceeds the strength of his bones, his bones are going to break. It's that easy. That's how injuries happen, any single injury. Okay. So as we move forwards, I want you guys to think about that. The middle zone in between, so between the strength of our tissues and that black line, which is the load, that's the buffer that we have. That's our margin of safety. So it's our job as wellness and fitness professionals to figure out how do we increase that buffer? Either how do we drop the black line down or how do we increase the blue line up? And for firefighters, job's incredibly demanding. It's highly, uh, highly chaotic. You really don't know what you're going to be dealing with sometimes. So we can't change that black line at the bottom. So what do we have to do? We have to bring the blue line up. We have to increase capacity or increase the strength of those tissues. But we also know that from an injury standpoint, when we're talking about lifting, how we move really, really matters. Anybody in here ever heard to lift with your legs and not with your back? Probably, maybe too many times. It's like, ah, oh, I don't want to hear that again. I know that's how I feel. So I show this picture to a lot of firefighters and with the whole lift with your legs and not with your back, and I ask them, which of these two individuals is safer, is using a more effective pattern? Which one is increasing that margin of safety between those two lines? And because the guy on the left is bending his knees, trying to get down nice and close to the load, the typical response is, that's safer. He's lifting with le his legs and not with his back. But I'm here to tell you, from an injury standpoint, the guy on the right is way safer. That's way more effective. Because from an injury standpoint, the curvature of your back, so the, the guy on the left is rounding his back, the guy on the right is not. The curvature of your back is way more important than the angle of your trunk or your torso. So I can be completely bent over. As long as my back is flat, I'm good. But the second I round my back, now I'm putting myself at risk. Now I'm like that guy trying to lift 300 pounds off the ground with his elbows. So when we say lift with your legs and not with your back, it's kind of gets setting people, some people up for failure because the, the focus hasn't been put on the right things. So in this case, we can encourage people to lift like the guy on the right if their back is nice and straight. And sometimes, as you guys are well aware of, you're in situations where you can't bend your knees. So I'm saying you don't have to. We need to rethink how we're viewing fitness. We need to rethink how we're trying to prevent injuries. And we can do this by understanding how they happen in the first place. The other thing with firefighters, not all injuries happen from a one-time event. They don't all happen by falling off ladders and falling through floors. A lot of the injuries that are being sustained by firefighters are the result of an accumulation of damage over time. It's maybe why some of the younger guys aren't getting hurt, and then as you start to age, it's like, oh my God, my knees, my back, my shoulder, what's going on? All this stuff catches up to you. So we go back to the same type of uh, the graph here. Line at the bottom, that, or top of, is that blue line. That's the strength of our tissues again. Black line at the bottom. First time I expose you to that load, I want you guys thinking maybe getting in out of the truck. First time you do it, seemingly simple task, not too demanding, I don't get hurt. We still got that margin of safety. Do it again, not so bad, still no injury. Over time, what's happening to that blue line? It's starting to go down. Our tissues are getting weaker. They're degrading. I like to equate this to a wire coat hanger. You bend a wire coat hanger once, what happens? Does it break? No. Twice? No. Eventually, you start wearing it down. So a seemingly 
mundane task, seemingly low load, causes the tissue to break, causes the coat hanger to break. The only difference between our tissues and the coat hanger is our tissues can recover. We can actually increase that blue line. We can raise it up a little bit. We can make ourselves safer. We can become more resilient. We can increase that buffer, that safe zone, if we're smarter about how we're trying to prevent this stuff from happening in the first place. Two pictures at the top I show you guys. The one on the left, that's a nice healthy disc in your back. The right one is a not so healthy one. When you herniate a disc, so I'm not sure if anybody's ever herniated a disc before, but it's one of the, the common injuries to our back. When you herniate your disc, that nice gooey bit in the middle of the disc on the left works its way out the back, like the one on the right. That can only happen over time. You can't fall off a ladder and herniate a disc. The only way you can herniate a disc is repeatedly perform some type of activity that causes that blue line to go down. So if that type of injury can only happen in a very specific way, that gives us a lot of really good insight into how we should prevent this from happening. So we can take that information, apply it to an exercise setting, apply it to a training world, and actually start making a difference. That's the stuff that we're trying to integrate uh, and empower our PFTs with so they can actually make a difference in their stations. But if we don't understand how this stuff happens in the first place, then we might be a little misdirected. Another exercise example here. So we saw the first guy trying to lift a big heavy load. This guy's trying to increase his flexibility, stretching his hamstrings out. He's you know, here talking about he's moving his hands up the wall, lengthening the back of his legs here, lengthening his hamstrings. But I would ask, is he actually stretching his hamstrings? Sure, he might feel a little pullback there, but any higher the guy gets up the wall, he's rounding his back more. If you, got, if you just flip this guy up on his feet, does he look kind of similar to those guys that were lifting? Yeah, it's the exact same pattern. Remember I said curvature of your back is more important than the angle of your trunk? Is his back curved? Of course it's curved. So this guy, in trying to become better prepared, in trying to stretch out his hamstrings, he could actually be causing more harm because he's stretching his back. He's rounding his back out. The other thing I would say is stretching can be great for certain things. When we stretch our back, we have to ask, what are those tissues we're actually stretching? What are we trying to lengthen? So if we're stretching at our hip, yeah, we're getting those muscles back here. But our muscles don't limit the range of motion of our back. What limits the range of motion? Ligaments, discs, bones. We don't want to stretch that stuff. In trying to get better prepared, this guy is stretching things that we don't want to stretch. So if he's stretching things that we don't want to stretch, Maybe he's predisposing himself to injury inadvertently. Again, if we understand how these things happen, we can be a lot smarter in what we do to prevent this stuff. That's the point. We have to view fitness and wellness through a different lens. It's not all about making people work really, really hard. It's about making people work really, really smart so we can go back to those things that are really important to you guys. Health and safety on the job, playing with your kids, running that first marathon. That's the stuff that's important. So let's look at this a little bit differently. How are we getting there? This has kind of been the work that I've been doing for the past 10 years or so. I want to know how do we take what we do in an exercise world and make it matter for firefighters? So this is actually firefighters from Pensacola. This is a simulation of their skeletons. So we brought them into the lab. We hooked them all up like they did uh, do in the video games. And we had them perform a variety of simulated fire ground tasks. We did this before and after we tested a couple different exercise approaches. 
We wanted to know, does how you exercise make a difference in the things that really matter? Like I said, I don't care about making you better in the gym. I care about making you better at life. So if I care about making you better at life, I want to know, does what you do in a gym environment make this stuff different? Does it impact how you do these things? If it doesn't, I need to go back to the drawing board. Because I'm not really impacting the things that are most important. But if it does, now we can start to see some progress. What we did with these guys from Pensacola is we tested two different approaches to exercise. One was, let's get these guys really, really fit. This is the conventional approach to exercise. I want to increase your strength and your endurance and your aerobic capacity, all those things that are really, really important to firefighting. Second group, same thing. We know that stuff's really, really important. But we also emphasized how you're exercising. How are we actually getting there? How are we moving in this process? So we emphasize, let's get really, really fit, but let's be a little bit smarter about how we're getting there. What do you think we found? There is a difference. So both groups, really, really fit. Like I said before, lots and lots of benefits to exercise. We know that. We can make our firefighters really, really fit by engaging in regular physical activity. We can improve our firefighters' confidence by participating in regular physical activity. That's great. But what about all that stuff that matters? Is it actually transferring to the things that are really, really important? That's the big question. Are we making a difference in our members' lives? Because again, I don't want to make you really, really good at the gym. I want to make you really, really good at life. So, what we found is that there was a big difference and how the firefighters performed those simulated tasks that I showed you guys before. The firefighters that went through the fitness only program got really, really fit, but we may have increased the risk for injury because we didn't place an emphasis on how they were performing. So when we looked at them afterwards, they actually got worse from a safety standpoint. The other side got better. When we placed an emphasis on how you're performing, we saw a difference. And it wasn't just in the gym. What we saw is transfer to the things that are really, really important. That's critical. How we exercise, just by emphasizing a few small things that I'll share with you guys in a sec. Just a few small things made a massive difference. We can use exercise to change the way our firefighters perform outside of the gym. We can use exercise to change our firefighters' behaviors. That's really what that's saying. I show you a picture of RG3 here again. Phenomenal football talent. Lots of potential. He's always hurt. I show you the picture on the left. RG3 at the combine a few years ago doing his vertical jump. His vertical jump was about 40 inches. Phenomenal. RG3's knees bang together when he jumps. If I could give you guys one piece of advice to go home and feel what it's like to tear your ACL, that's what I'd say to do. Go home, jump up and down, and bang your knees together. That would be my advice. That's what RG3 is doing. RG3 had one ACL injury before that jump and one injury after that jump. To me, it's no surprise that he's hurt. If we look at RG3's long jump, his broad jump, which is the middle pitcher, he's using the exact same movement pattern. What does this tell me? RG3 has developed a bad habit. RG3's bad habit is that when he jumps, his knees come together. If RG3 never changes that habit, he's never going to be healthy. He's always going to be hurt. We look at him tearing his ACL in the game, his knee is doing the exact same thing. If we never go in and change our firefighters' habits or our behaviors, 
We don't stand any chance at preventing some of these injuries. We don't stand any chance at improving their performance. And the other thing is if we can change our firefighters' habits, like we've shown we can, with emphasis on a few small things, that stuff transcends the gym environment. It goes everywhere. So we can make RG3 better in, in the gym, and that might make them better on the field. We can make a firefighter better in the gym, that's going to make them safer on the fire ground. That's going to make them more effective in their golf game, when they're running their marathon. And that's going to give them more durability to play with their kids long in retirement. If we place an emphasis on some few small things, I'm going to show you guys three small things. That's it. Can I have everybody cross their arms for a sec for me? Just cross your arms. You guys too? You guys too? Now cross them the other way. Kind of weird? <laughs> yeah. It's like, what the? I don't even know how to do it. Why is that? We've ingrained a habit. We created a habit. It's the same stuff on a daily basis. It's putting your pant leg, the same leg, every single day. It's if you lift on the fire ground a certain way, chances are that's the same way you're lifting in the gym, and vice versa. So, if we make things better in a training environment and tra change your habits, allow you to move your arms the other way, the idea is that's also going to transfer. It becomes a new habit. So if we change our, the RG3's jumping habit, the idea is that makes them better in the things that are really, really important. Playing football. Firefighters are the same way. Okay? We need to view exercise as a means to change our firefighters' habits. If we can do that, we're going to make a massive difference. And I'm here to tell you, there are a few small things. I'm going to give you guys three. A few small things that we can do to make that stuff matter. And if we can change our habits, we can change our lives. I'm going to give you guys another example here. This basically sums up what I said. So if we practice bad stuff in a training environment, we shouldn't expect to get anything different than bad stuff on the other end. Video on the left. I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with this athlete. His name is Brandon Roy. He was a professional basketball player in the NBA. Played for the Portland Trailblazers. His career was cut short because of knee injuries. This is Brandon Roy with his elite trainer doing some crazy exercise, lunging up and down the floor. This is him going up and down the floor. I want you to watch his knees. He's doing the exact same thing RG3 was. His career was cut short because of knee injuries. If this is how our firefighters are preparing in a training environment, why would we expect them not to look like the firefighter on the right in a non-training environment? We shouldn't. Bad stuff in, bad stuff out. We keep reinforcing this bad stuff. That creates the habit. We've all heard practice makes perfect. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Practice makes things stick. We need to practice good stuff if we want good stuff on the other end. Or else we're going to get this firefighter. This firefighter, at some point, is going to hurt his knee. We have to change the habit. And we can do that with a few small things. To highlight this even a little bit more, so this is a few years ago. I, I did some work with the department in Canada, tracked injuries over a five-year span. We tried to categorize, describe the injuries uh, by job duty and by movement pattern. We wanted to know, is it the same type of movement patterns that are causing these problems regardless of job duty? At the station, on the fire ground, emergency call, in the gym, whatever it may be. What we saw from a low back perspective, 70% of all low back injuries were related to lifting type activities, regardless of job duty. So this tells me that the way you're lifting here is the way you're lifting here and the way you're lifting here. It's the same thing because we've created a habit. So to prevent that stuff, if we can change the way you lift here, well maybe that's going to change the way you lift here and the way you lift here. 
So if we prevent some of these exercise-related injuries, chances are that's going to prevent some of these other injuries from happening on the fire ground at an emergency call at the station. And we saw even more for the knees and the shoulders. So knee injuries was all related to lunging or, or, or running type activities. It was getting on and off the truck, dragging a hose. It was 81% uh, of all knee injuries. It's the same stuff. If we just may, or be a little smarter, like the RG3 thing, and not let our knees collapse, we can prevent a lot of this stuff from happening. Shoulders, 99% of all shoulder injuries related to pushing and pulling. Crazy. Again, what that tells me is it's the habits that transcend everything that are responsible for a lot of these problems. But it also makes me very optimistic because if we can use training to better prepare our members, be a little smarter by emphasizing some very small things, we might be able to solve a lot of or these problems, prevent a lot of the injuries from taking place in the first place. So what we want to do in a training environment, let's identify some key things. I'm going to give you guys three. Let's identify some key things that we want to emphasize in a training environment. And if we can do that, the hope is that these things emerge and persist in the stuff that's really, really important. This is the stuff on the fire ground. This is the stuff at home. This is the stuff in your recreational activities. Let's focus on some key things that we know are really, really important from a performance standpoint, from an efficiency standpoint, from an injury standpoint. If we can do that, we can make a massive difference. So again, I'm going to give you guys three things. I want you taking these home, sharing them with your family members, sharing them with your friends. If we can do that, if we can let every single firefighter across our two countries know what these three things are, we can make a big, big difference. Just by becoming aware of what these things are. Sadly, right now, we just don't know. Our firefighters just don't know what's important. Let's let them know. Let's make a difference. So, what are these three things? Well, I showed you big three injuries for firefighters. Low back, knees, shoulders. That's it. Some of you guys have probably experienced this or know peers, family members who have. What I'm showing you here is low back. From a low back perspective, we go back to that lifting thing. I said the curvature of your back is much more important than what your trunk is doing. So what I'm showing you here, we got two lines on the back. Whether we're lifting, whether we're squatting, whether we're in the gym, whether we're at home, what I want to see, those two lines don't get farther apart. That's it. Whatever you're doing, keep those two lines the same distance apart. One through your hips, one through your shoulders. If they go farther apart, what does that mean? It means you're rounding your back. We gotta stop rounding our backs. I don't care if you're bent over, if you're upright, don't round your back. If we can take that to all aspects of a firefighter's life, if we can start creating new habits related to just that, we can make a big, big difference in those back injuries. The other thing, it's gonna make you more efficient. It's going to increase your performance. So if your goal is just to perform at a really, really high level, that's also going to help. So the first thing I want you guys walking away with, from a low back perspective, let's keep those two lines the same distance apart. That's number one. Number two, this is going back to RG3. I said, if I can give you one thing to go and tear your ACL, it's going to be, let's bang your knees together when you're jumping or you're running. What I'm going to get you to do, keep your knee in line with your hip and your foot. That's it. That's it. If you're walking upstairs, if you're going out for a run, if you're dragging a hose, if you're in the gym, doesn't matter. If you draw a line from your hip all the way down to your toes, keep your knee on that line. That's number two. First one for the back, keep those two lines same distance apart. Second one, keep your knee in line with your hip and your toes. That's it. If we can do that across these two countries, we can make a big, big difference. 
Number three, said something about the shoulders. So we're going to use two lines again. One through the shoulders, one through your ears. I want you to keep those two lines apart again. Whether you're in the gym, whether you're on the job, doesn't matter. Keep your shoulders down. That's number three. If you guys can walk away from today with just those three things, share it with your peers, share it with your family members, we can make a big, big difference. Just by becoming aware of what's important. One for the back, two lines, don't let them go apart. One for the knees, keep it in line with your hip and your toes. Number three, keep your shoulders away from your ears. That's it. Keep it really, really, really simple. This is exercise, this is job, this is life. Doesn't matter where it is. Really, by just focusing on these three things, if you let all your firefighters know about these three things, that this is really, really what's important to make their exercise matter, what you're doing is you're teaching them how to perform any exercise. Doesn't matter. Squats, lunges, this, that, doesn't matter. These three things. You're teaching your firefighters how to perform safely regardless of the activity. Go back to these three things. Then, what we're trying to do from a peer fitness training standpoint is empower our PFTs to say, okay, what can we say to get our firefighters to achieve these things? Maybe they just don't get it. You know, I say keep those two lines apart, and he says, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Is this right? Well, no. So what can I say? What can I do? So we, we're working at look, uh, giving our, our, our PFTs coaching cues or some suggestions to help empower the members. And sometimes it's not the same coaching cues that are going to work for everybody. So we might need to get creative. Got a little story for you guys. So, when I was doing some work with the Pensacola Fire Department, we had firefighters of all ages and backgrounds participating, getting involved in the exercise program. We had one guy, 58-year-old firefighter named Bubba. Bubba never exercised before. But, you know, when we told Bubba about the benefits of the program and quality of life, he's like, oh man, I love fishing. I just want to go fishing on the weekend. We're like, awesome. This can help with that. This can help you be more durable. See your grandkids. He's like, oh, this is fantastic. So we started Bubba with the program. And Bubba had never thought about any of this stuff before. He had no body awareness. You know, go to lift something up and, you know, am I doing it right? And we're like, no, sorry, Bubba, you're not quite doing it right. And we say, you know, you got to keep your back straight. And Bubba just couldn't get it. And so we thought, okay, we got to get creative with Bubba. How are we going to get him to achieve what we want him to achieve? And so the coach that was working with Bubba realized he was a hunter. And the coach was a hunter. So he's like, huh, all right i got to connect with Bubba here. So he said, all right, Bubba. What I want you to think about is when you're bending over, I want you to think about shooting an arrow out of your butt at that back wall. Right away, Bubba said, oh, like this? And he's like, that's it. So right away, Bubba got it. It wasn't that he couldn't do it. He just wasn't connecting with the cues we were using. So the point of that is it's still focused on those three things. Those things never change. But how we get there, we got to connect with the firefighters. So whether it's an older guy, no experience whatsoever, younger guy, no experience, or it's a really experienced person with exercise. Same three things. The road to get there is just a little bit different. Okay, so still, share those same three things with every single member in your department. And again, I'm going to go back to this. This is the stuff that's important. It's not just exercise. So in addition, by giving you guys those three things, we're teaching you how to be safer and more effective in anything that you do. Let's integrate it into fire ground training. Let's highlight the benefit of these three things from a life standpoint. Going upstairs at home. Like, think back to that firefighter I mentioned in the beginning. Paying for 20 years, going upstairs. How has that guy's quality of life changed at home just by knowing those three things? Amazing. So just by knowing these three things, just by emphasizing, becoming aware of these three things, we're going to make this stuff better. 
when you guys reflected on what's important at the very beginning, whether it was the job, whether it's recreation, whether it's quality of life at home, doesn't matter. These same three things are going to be important regardless. That's the beauty of this. And if we can really embrace the importance of these things, it's going to start to create new habits. And once we start to create new habits, then we see our quality of life change. Then we see the improvements. We start to feel better. We get more energy. We start sharing this information with our peers. Then we start changing the culture in the department. Then we see all the potential benefits just by focusing on these small things. There's huge power in small things. That's the big, big point. I'm going to give you guys a framework. So we've heard a little bit about demands and capacity. This is how I think every single person here should be viewing their preparation for their life. Every single person in here has demands. They're physical, they're emotional, they're psychological. They're all real. Every single person has a capacity to deal with those demands. Our demands are the things that we need to do and the things that we want to do. Again, I'm not going to tell you what those things are. That's up to you to tell me. What do you need to do? What do you want to do? Then, what I want to do is I want to provide you with the opportunity to build your capacity so you can handle all those demands. Again, physical, emotional, psychological. So our capacity is not just our abilities. It's not just fitness. Again, we're going bigger picture. Our capacity is our awareness. It's our motivation. It's got an emotional piece. It's the physical side. We have to have the capacity to handle our demands. I don't want to say to someone, you know, a firefighter comes to me and says, here's my demands. This is what I want to do. I want to keep running long into retirement. I don't want to tell that firefighter, you know what? Not going to happen. How would that make them feel? Not very good. I don't want to be told that I can't do something I, don't, I, I want to do. So instead, I'm going to bump up the capacity. I don't want to take away. I want to give. I want to give you so much capacity that you can handle anything. That's what we're trying to do. That's the power that our peer fitness trainers can have. Our peer fitness trainers can understand how do we actually provide our firefighters with the tools, with the resources, so they can build their capacity to, to handle anything. And again, it's not just physical. There's so many different components to this. But if we look at that continuum at the top, that what I've called the wellness and fitness continuum, this is everywhere. Whether you're at the far left, maybe you, you just sustained an injury, or you're suffering from a disease, you're in the rehabilitation stage, doesn't matter, demands capacity. Our job is to build your capacity. On the other end of the spectrum, we're talking about performance, it's the same thing. So we can view every single firefighter, every single situation in this context. Demands capacity. It's our job to build our firefighters' capacity so they can do all those things they love to do at the end of the day. And all those things they need to do on the job. We have to prepare our firefighters for life. And if you guys, a couple uh, quotes here. Some of you have probably heard these or maybe even said them yourselves. Been doing it for years. Can't be the problem. So now that you know how injuries happen, now that you know the story of that firefighter with 20 years of experience and knee pain, what can we say about that? Not true at all. And as a matter of fact, we can change it like this. You may have been uh, suffering from something for years, unknowingly living with it unnecessarily living with it. One small change can make a massive difference. Just by becoming aware of what's important, your life can change today. This is a big emphasis of what we're trying to do with the peer fitness training program. We're bringing it out of the exercise world. Yes, 
our trainers are still going to be experts uh, with the exercise piece. But we're really showing them how their impact can extend so far beyond that. We got to go back to the life. The things that we're, we're, the information that we're giving them, the skills that we're giving them are useful everywhere. And it is the small steps that lead to biggest changes. If somebody doesn't like exercise, my first step is not going to be come exercise. It's not going to work. So we have to figure out what is that small step that we can take to get this person on the right track, to live that better life. So it's understanding how do we get there? What is the process? What is the process that can, that can work with any single firefighter, regardless of their goals, regardless of their needs? Let's make sure we can cater to everybody. I don't want this program to be just geared to this one demographic. We gotta get everybody involved. When we emphasize quality of life, when we have our firefighters reflect on the things that are really, really important, that's what we get. We get more involvement. We get people to buy in. Then we start seeing changes. So the first thing, a great first step, I want you guys to be ambassadors for change. Even if you're not part of the Fear of Fitness, Fitness Training Program, become an ambassador for change by understanding these steps. First step, we have to inspire our members. We have to change the attitude. I had you guys really think about what does health and fitness mean to you? That's important. We have to understand what is the current perception of health and fitness, health and wellness. A lot of people, it's like, I don't want any part of that. I've heard lift with your legs and not with your back before. I don't want to hear it again. If that's the current perception of things, we have to know that. Because we have to figure out how do we navigate it and get that individual involved in the process. We can't just say, oh, lost cause, let's move on. It's not going to work. We have to inspire all of our members. So we have to figure out how do we get there. We have to understand that all of our members have different objectives. Some of them are performance related. Some of them are quality of life related. Some of them are health and safety related. This is what you guys are probably thinking about when we think health and wellness. A variety of different things. So we need to know that. Maybe your only desire in life is to go fishing every single day. Awesome. Let's make sure that the messages that we're using to sell this idea of wellness and fitness caters to that. If we don't cater to the things that are important to you guys, it's not going to matter. So we have to understand what really, really matters. That's going to help with the messaging. That's going to help with how we sell this idea of wellness and fitness. We've been doing uh, some work with the Toronto Fire Department up in Canada. And part of the, uh, the, the project was, let's try and understand what the current perceptions are. Then we introduced a very, very small workshop. And I wanted to know, is there a way to connect with everybody in the audience regardless of their reasons to be there, regardless of their view, our current perceptions about health and wellness, performance, quality of life, safety, all that stuff. Regardless of those things, can we tap into everyone and make them motivated to get involved? We've got about 400 people involved. Lots of variety, as you guys would well uh, expect, in the interests and the, the, the needs, the wants of the program. We surveyed them after a three-hour session. Three hours, that was it. After a three-hour session, we asked them, how, motiv how motivated are you to be healthier, safer at work? How motivated are you to be healthier and safer at home? And how motivated are you to help your peers, to motivate your peers, to bring them into the program? We had, what is it, 94% agree. They were highly motivated to perform healthier and safer at work. 91 at home. And we had 80, 88% of about 400 people say that after three hours, regardless of the reasons to be there, were motivated to get their peers involved. That's amazing. It's small things, guys. We started with, with those three things. We highlighted the importance of these things in all aspects of your life. That was it. We tried to tap into the things that are really, really important and say, regardless of your objectives, you can want to perform at a high level. You can want to play with your kids. You can want to run that marathon. It doesn't matter. 
we made it matter to them. And if we can make it matter to our peers, to our members, we can make a big, big difference in a very short period of time. And that's what we're seeing. By the responses here, firefighters saying they're motivated to get their, other, their peers involved, that's fantastic. And let's not stop there. Let's keep the momentum going. So what do we do after we get people bought in? Well, now we can educate them. Now we can provide that really, really good information that we know is important. If I try and educate you guys and you don't care and you're not bought in, it's not going to matter. So I have to make it matter. Make it matters, number one. After it matters, after you see how this can impact your life, now we can start providing with, with some information. But only after you've bought in, only after you care, can we start providing education. This is the firefighter from the very beginning. All I said, when you walk upstairs, don't let your knee fall in like you see in the picture. That's it. That's that little tidbit of, of information. That's the education. It can be as small as that. Okay? There's huge power in this. But the first step, you have to have buy-in first. They have to understand why this stuff matters to them. This is why I ask you guys to be selfish. When we're providing education, again, we're going to go back to key things. Keep it really, really, really simple. I've given you guys three things today. In the PFT course, we talk about seven. Those of you who were there with me yesterday, we talked about seven key features. Really, really important. We can start small and grow from there. Another story for you guys. So two weeks ago, I was giving a, a, a workshop to a group of fitness professionals from across Canada. These are experts in the field. I said nothing more than these seven things. So in addition to the three, there are four more. Seven things, and we talked about some coaching cues that go along with these seven things. I had a woman come up to me afterwards, didn't say anything, she started crying. This woman was a fitness professional, had been working in the industry for 10 years, at a very high level, one of the best in Canada, so-called, came up to me crying at the end. She said, you know, I have to say thank you because for the first time in 10 years, I was actually able to feel something that I've been trying to feel for 10 years. I've seen all these professionals across the country. I work with clients every single day, and I could never get this. I said, holy crap. Again, I said nothing more than what I've said to you guys. And we gave some very simple cues to achieve these seven things. That was it. This fitness professional with 10 years of experience, considered one of the best in Canada, had never been able to do it. We started simple, and she changed in an instant. That's the power that this stuff can have. And again, that's the power because it transcends every single background. It doesn't matter what your experience is. This stuff matters everywhere. The other thing that we're trying to do is we realize that learning is so much more important than teaching. There's a, I've been in the education world for about 16 years now. Teaching has been the focus. So how do we give, this, give you this information? What's the content that we're going to give you? What is that educational piece? I think the bigger question is how do we facilitate learning? How do we actually have our firefighters learn this stuff? Because I can get up here and convey this message, but if you guys aren't hearing what I'm saying, that's my fault. But I haven't asked the right question. Are you actually learning the stuff that I'm giving you? And so what we're trying to do with our peer fitness training program and education in general is really focus on learning. Let's make sure our firefighters are learning the things that are important. It's not just about giving them information. This whole education step is a learning piece. It's not just a teaching piece. After we provide education, so first step is changing attitudes. We gotta inspire our people. Second step is the education. Let's change perceptions of these things that are really, really important. It's spine curvature, it's not trunk angle. Now, we start to change behaviors. Now, we start to develop those good habits. That's the third step. This is when we start to see that progress. This is when people start to get excited because they start to see a change in the things that are really, really important. We start to see a change in the way that we're moving. We start to feel a little bit differently. We start to feel a little bit better. We start to feel safer on the fire ground. This is when we're really creating some momentum. 
And what do you, what do you think happens when people start to feel better? They want to share it. When you start seeing changes, you want to share this information with your peers, with your family members. You become an ambassador for change. So with the third step, once we start seeing changes in our behavior and our habits, this is when we start to see a change in the culture and a shift in the attitudes across the department. This is what we're trying to do with our peer fitness trainers. We're trying to empower them so they can be ambassadors for change. So they can influence their peers and then those peers can influence more peers. And we can start changing the culture. But it's a process. We got to start with step one. We got to start with buy-in. We got to start with getting people excited about the potential. Why does this matter to me? Ultimately, this is where we're trying to go. We're trying to change lives. And to do this, we have to train with a purpose. We have to educate with a purpose. It's small steps to get there. This is the goal. I firmly believe we can get there. I think we're making progress because we're taking small steps. Let's not take that giant leap. We don't need to. The Peer Fitness Training Program is really trying to give our PFTs the tools so they can walk their peers through this process. And in doing so, they're going to make a massive difference in the health and safety in the department and the quality of life of every single member. And again, I commend the IFF for what they're doing into trying to spread this word. So in, in summary for me, regardless of whether your goal is health and safety on the fire ground, or you want to put, it, put on a Speedo and run along the beach, I'm not here to judge. I want to know what's important to you. But I encourage you guys to become aware of the things that are really, really important. Let's start with those three things. Let's start with motivating and inspiring our peers to change their attitude towards health and wellness. And then they can see the benefits in running on the beach in their Speedo or health and safety on the fire ground. Thank you.